So finally, hello and welcome to the session Hybrid News Documenting True Events in cooperation with Berlinale Forum and Berlinale Native. And I'm very happy to introduce you to our three guests, all former talents alumni. So um, we have Marcelo um, um, Martinez, I'm sorry. <laughs> he is director and editor from Baraguay, and he is here with his short film, Caray Norte at Berlinale Native. Welcome. Then we have Shaibu Husseini from Nigeria, film critic and journalist, has also written a book about narrative in Nollywood. Welcome. <laughs> and Atsushi Funahashi, Japanese director, who is here with his film Nuclear Nation 2 in, forum, um, in the section Forum, and I guess it's already the fifth film here at Berlinale. Welcome. And Oliver Baumgarten, one of our colleagues, he's running the talent press here at the Berlinale Talents. Um, he is leading through the discussion. He's also publisher, curator, and also program manager of the film festival Max Office Prize in Saarbrücken. So enjoy and ask questions. Yeah, thanks a lot, Andrea. Um, yeah, also from my side, a um, warm welcome to this session, Hybrid News Documenting True Events. And um, this session will be about uh, documentary filmmaking. And um, yeah, documentary, um, or let's say um, non-fictional um, storytelling, has become extremely successful in the last years. I mean, um, um, successful uh, on one hand with the filmmakers, meaning that a lot of filmmakers who used to do um, fiction films tend also to work in the documentary field and successful also um, meaning uh, uh, with the audience because um, in, in, in Europe a lot of documentary films in the last years have been uh, really successful in the theatres and uh, this popularity of documentary filmmaking um, um, has led in the last years to, um, yeah, to some strong developments in, in form, in shaping a form. And um, I would say in general that um, the documentary per se um, is uh, yeah, very closely related to journalism at first. I mean, of course, it's not a news genre, but still documentaries have to um, or deal with uh, giving information and uh, deal also with uh, doing research like in, the, in the, like in the journalism. But in the last years, more and more um, forms arose and uh, um, uh, it's, um, it's really forms of which you can't really tell which is um, if it's fictional or is it factual um, just to name some prominent examples uh, let's say from um, Ari Folman's animated documentary Waltz with Bashir or um, also very prominent uh, Michael Moore's let's call it opinion driven um, uh, documentary films or um, to name a third one Ulrich Seidel's films which are mostly staged uh, in, in whole. Um, well, as we all know, we live in a world that is di dictated by, uh, by images and, um, uh, you know, the process of digitalization in the last years have um, strongly promoted this, de this development in general. And um, year after year, new, new platforms and new um, media uh, come up that makes it easier to um, access picture, uh, images or that enables us to communicate um, via images. So uh, images are getting um, or are still very, very powerful um, and can be also powerful weapons. So um, when you use images in a proper way, then, you can, then this can lead to, um, yeah, to, um, to, to convince people. Uh, images can, can be opinion forming in a way. Um, so um, that means that the responsibility for filmmakers who are working in the documentary field um, is extremely high. It's a responsibility towards that topic and it's a responsibility, of course, towards um, the audience who tends to believe, of course, what they see when it's called a documentary. Um, but now the questions that we, um, that we can talk about is uh, now does that means that a documentary film therefore has to be only objective? Is that the only possibility for a documentary film? Does a documentary film need necessarily 
um, to be true really for everybody. Um, does a documentary filmmaker has to work with the principle of a journalist, um, of a news journalist, it's quoted like that. So, um, yes, Andrea already said we invited two uh, filmmakers um, who work uh, in, in, in this field and who, who walk the line between um, documentary and fiction film in the last years in their works. And... Um, and a film journalist uh, uh, to um, to add from this side of um, of the medal. Um, yeah, I just want to add one or two little things to, um, to the uh, to the guests we have. Um, Atsushi Funahashi um, has been here for uh, yeah for six years in a row more or less. No, for for, uh, for five films um, shown here in the Berlinale, all at the um, Berlinale Forum. Uh, in 2004, he was here at the Berlinale Talent. Campus. It was called in those days, 2004, and, um, and next year he came back with the first feature film, Big River. Um, he did also a lot of um, documentary format films for Japanese television, as well as now um, to um, um, let's call them artificial documentaries, um, calling Nuclear Nation One and Nuclear Nation Part Two. Um, so then um, from Paraguay, we have writer-director uh, Marcelo Martinez. He was participant in 2013 and 2014, I guess. And last year, you, um, you were with a new project at the stock station um, uh, and developing this new project. And um, your fictional work has shown at the Berlinale um, several times. Ultima Street, we will see in, uh, a clip from was in Berlinale Generation. And maybe you watched on Saturday uh, in, at the opening, the film um, The Man of the North, a beautiful black and white short film that was shown in Berlinale Shorts and this year in the Berlinale Native section. And from the journalistic point of view, um, we invited Shaibu Husseini from Nigeria. Um, he was part of the Talent Press program in 2004, I guess, and he's uh, really one of the, oops, one of the um, most prominent um, um, yeah, experts in Nigerian uh, film. So I would like to start with you, uh, Shaibu, um, because maybe a lot of us know um, the one or the other Nollywood film, um, but maybe not so well um, what's going on in the documentaries in Nigeria. Maybe you could start telling us a bit about the situation of documentaries in Nigeria. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, for me, I consider this a very quick transition from being a talent to being an expert. So it's nice to be back to Berlinale as an expert. Of course, you know, um, I mean, it's in public space that we have one of the largest culture machine, which we call Nollywood. Um, it's a very vibrant industry, big home movie industry. Um, according to records of the National Film and Video Census Board, which is the regulatory agency, we produce about 1,000 or so movies um, every year. Home movies, I'm not talking about film. Home movies annually, but they could, they could be more because like every other industry, there are quite a number of movies that get into the market without necessarily passing through the regulators. Um, it's a vibrant industry, although now the production level has really come down because of um, lack of funding, issue of piracy and all that. So we have a very big industry but a fiction-based industry. As for documentary, I think it's just gradually catching on. And that is the fact that not so many people are interested in that genre. They feel that it is too tedious. We lack the capacity to do as much documentaries as we do in fiction films. There's funding issues. There's also the issue of where to show the documentaries because all the platforms that we have are just interested in showing fiction films and all that. So documentary films you could find in television stations. They are mostly commissioned by television stations, but they are not like the mainstay of the industry at the moment. But there is a growing interest in that. Now there is even a festival dedicated to documentary films in the country, and we are hoping that that will encourage a lot of our filmmakers to also consider making films in that area. But nothing much is happening in terms of documentaries. We have very few filmmakers who are working in that area. And I must say that not too long from now, we will also have a platform where we can show them because there's no use making these films and you don't have where to distribute them and to show them. But you have a lot of platforms for those fiction films that you see everywhere and all that. So it's catching on really in Nigeria, but it is not 
the mainstay, not too many interest in the area of documentary films, but it's catching on. And uh, when I understood it right, then it's more when they are related to the television station, then they're more um, made from the, the approach of, let's say, journalistic um, way. So that it's more journalistic documentaries. Yes, I even wanted to say that most of what, even in the midst of some of the works that we see as documentaries, um, I am on the panel of the selection panel of the African Movie Academy Awards, and we get a lot of documentaries from Nigeria and other parts of, the, of Africa. And most of what we see are basically news features. They, <laughs> they are presented like news. I mean, you, you just have people working with archival materials, then you have talking heads, then you have somebody narrating. You know, the kind of documentaries, uh, the kind of news features you find Ali Mazri do in those days, those are the kind of documentaries that you have. We do not have those kind of very deep documentaries that are like history books, that are like journal, uh, journalism in Iran, on, on the run and all that. So most of what we have are news features. They approach as news. You know, there's a topical issue and then they pick it up and then you find somebody actually standing up as if he's, 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 he's reporting an event and all that. And the next thing you see are clips and the rest. But that is not to say that there are people who, I mean, who have not approached it the professional way. We have but they are not much. So most of the documentaries you find on TV and even on other platforms are basically approached from the, from the um, news point of view. They, 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 they are presented like news features than actual documentaries. Yeah. And, and from your point of view as film critic, um, you're writing uh, for The Guardian, for The Nigerian Guardian? Yes, uh, yes for The Guardian. Yeah. Um, from your point of view um, as a film critic, how do you see these um, hybrid tendencies in, in, let's say, in the world cinema um, documentary scene? Um, how well, do you see that? Well, I think, I think we have really moved. We have really moved. We've gone past the time when documentaries are just history books. Now we have documentaries that are written as if you're reading an opinion page in the newspaper. We have documentaries that are like editorials in the newspaper. The only difference is that it's tedious, it has to take time, so you cannot be able to match up with the timeliness of a newspaper report, and you may not be able to match up with follow-up stories, but we have documentaries that have gone beyond you know, just documenting history or just having archival materials and somebody narrating and all that. With, with platforms like the social media and the rest, we even have people who could just jump up and make very short documentaries on very topical issues and even come back to that platform to follow it up and all that. So I, I see a very good journalist who train very well in the art of making films, turning out Uh, becoming very good documentary filmmakers, and I also see documentary filmmakers becoming very good journalists as well, yeah. because they, I mean, they follow the basic principles of, of reporting news. I mean, their news are timely, they are topical issues, they appeal to credibility of sources, you know, they get the right materials into their documentaries and also, and that's all you do. I mean, what is journalism? It's just the art of writing, editing, and publishing and you follow that same process in yeah. making documentaries as well. Okay, thank you. We come back to this, uh, to this topic of um, uh, opinion pages and also in, in documentaries, how to deal with opinion. Um, but I would like to, um, to come now to um, Atsushi Funahashi. Um, your two-part film, Nuclear Nation, um, is, um, or the second part will premiere tomorrow, I guess, in the Berlinale Forum. Um, it, four o'clock tomorrow, four o'clock, yeah. Um, It's a, um, as a nuclear nation, it's a long time observation of, um, um, uh, yeah, of Fukushima refugees and um, especially it's, uh, it's um, all refugees from one town, um, Futaba city, the Futaba city, um, the whole inhabitants um, um, had to move um, the places and um, uh, the situation. Um, how did you, maybe before we see a, a small part of the film, um, how exactly did you approach um, the film subject? Was it really on the basis of um, journalistic principle, meaning um, that you Yeah, ask yourself to be objective, um, balancing all perspectives, things, things like that. Was that the kind of approach uh, you began filming this? Uh, 
I, I've been a cinephile for a long time. Um, you know, when I came here uh, t to a Thailand campus in 2004, I, I was a pretty much a film student. Uh, I was uh, studying a film directing in New York. It's called a School of Visual Arts. It's it's kind of art school. Uh, you can learn the film directing and uh, you know writing uh, film scripts, and then you can learn editing. And I was a student uh, in 2004, so it's I'm very very happy to be back here anytime. This is the six times I'm here, and then you know every time I come here, like I try to talk at the Thailand campus because I I really appreciate uh, the time I was here, um, and uh, you know when I was here, like it's I get to know many people, and then through that, actually until now, uh, those are the my partners. So actually, I, I'd like to tell you that like the the, the friends and the uh, partners you find here is uh, very precious, actually. And uh, one thing uh, I want to say was, uh, you know, maybe because uh, I was living in New York and then now living in Tokyo and I experienced 9-11 uh, in New York and then I experienced 311 March 11 in Japan. So two disasters. And then I've been having a huge desire to make a fiction film. But whenever, like, I, wherever I live, like, there's a huge disaster happen. <laughs> so, so it's like you know, you know, everybody's talking about it. And also, look, like your brain is occupied about that every day. So it's it's it becomes you. It's it becomes impossible to do anything else. And then even look like at the fiction films. You somehow try to come up with some idea somehow related to the event. So documentary filmmaking become the tool. And method for me to do a more deeper research. That's how I started my career. So, like, so the, the you know, so by shooting documentary, it kind of serves as a research, and then also the you know, really, it really gives you a really good vibe, like, because you go there and you shoot every day and you talk to the people, then it becomes the film, and then it's really fun to do that. And then, I mean, I cannot say fun like when you go to the Ground Zero on, uh, after 9/11, but it's it's really disastrous scene. But uh, you see something beyond your imagination, and uh, you 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 never experienced in your life, and uh, you absorbing all those experience. Then you make a film after that. Uh, actually, back then in New York, I was making a television documentary, but uh, those experiences are so um, huge and impact on you, so it sits in you. For a while, then it starts kind of you start digesting it. Then I start writing uh, uh, the script. Um, in fact, uh, the Big River you said it's uh, it it was shown here in uh, 2005. Um, right after I made a documentary on 9/11, there, there's a one incident during that era. Like you remember the Bush George W. Bush, the he was saying after the 9/11. <laughs> He's going to do retaliation against Afghanistan and then also the war against Iraq for the you know you know fake reason for the WMD you know which he didn't find anything. Um, you know back then in, even in New York, even like the liberal people like my friends like they start saying the American friends they say, you know what like maybe we have to bomb their bomb them ass you know <laughs> that's what they said and I was I was shocked. Because, you know, you see many people really losing their loved ones in New York, and you, you get really emotional. So sometimes like, you justify that really retaliation. And there's a one uh, event, actually the incident in Arizona, that one uh, Sikh uh, guy who wears a turban, he's not a Muslim, you know, like he's from a little, uh, from uh, uh, north of India. And um, he was immigrant and then pumping a gas at the gas station in Arizona desert. And there's one American guy come by and then he shot with a shotgun on his head saying he's saving America. And it, it, it became a huge news. And then I read that on the internet and I thought, wow, it, it, it looks like the Arizona or the American West becomes like a Western film. You know, like a shooting of Indians or, you know, almost, you know, it's pretty much, you know, a hate crime, but also this uh, discrimination is there. Just because he was wearing a turban, 
he doesn't mean Muslim, but uh, you know, he just came up with a gun and he's saying he's protecting America. I mean, okay, how violent is that? And how um, it's, it's really shocking to me. And then, then it was a little while after the 9-11 and I was imagining maybe the American West goes back to the Western era, which like, a, the, like a John Ford movie. And so I put together this movie about the Big River, which is a road trip movie between the three different uh, friends. One is an uh, uh, American girl, and one is a Japanese backpacker <coughs> traveling the uh, American West, and one is the Pakistani immigrant who's always suffering uh, this discrimination. Mm -hmm. And so it's three different race people got together and then get in the car and then they drive. So it doesn't really necessarily talking about the discrimination. But you see the differences, and um, you know, through the friendship, they start seeing the real bond of the people, and also the, they start seeing the, uh, the discrimination. They have a slight, very slight level you have in, in a daily life, which I observed every day in New York. So, so the fiction uh, script, I wrote a script too with my American partner. Uh, the script becomes the kind of uh, the arena you can put all the thought and the feeling you experienced through the documentary shooting. Mm. So I go back, that's how like, I go back and forth between the fiction and documentary. You shoot documentary, then go mm -hmm. back to fiction. Then after that, you do another documentary. So, so here the, um, the beginning of the film for Big River was, uh, was, was news, let's say, but um, um, the Nuclear Nation film that that project you started when it even was in the news still, the, the, the subject, of course. And then, so you then decided um, to go a journalistic way with this documentary and not a fiction way. Um, so was it really um, your, from, from the beginning on, your goal not to um, emotionalize, for instance, or to, to try to be objective in, in discussing um, the, the problematic situation for the people from Futaba? Um. I'm a, a big fan, actually, of uh, American documentarist uh, Frederick Wiseman. Um, he, all, he does all those observational films. Uh, I recommend, highly recommend you like, to watch his movies. It's to he clears all the uh, preconception you have. So you don't plan ahead. You just go with the camera and see what you see. So you try to observe, you don't, you don't judge things, you don't plan to shoot. So I totally against writing a script of documentaries. I just shoot whatever I see. But uh, you, you kind of trust your guts. You think this is going to be very important. Then you just go with the camera and talk to the people. That's I, how I did, I did it at Nuclear Nation. Right after Fukushima nuclear disaster, this you know, power plants just exploded. Then I just grabbed the camera and went there and then start filming people, then you see many problems. You know, as you see in the European news, like I, I imagine then all the news media just go, this is a, the huge difference between the journalism and the filmmaking. The journalism goes where the problem is. You know, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, and it goes to the Tokyo, this uh, where the parliament is, the, or the politicians talking, or TEPCO, this electric company, they go there and then they do a press conference. They go back and between back, you know, those two spots. But uh, one thing I noticed is the people who evacuated, those people are really neglected. So I thought the people who got most suffering is the one like, uh, the neglected the most. Mm -hmm. You know, the, for the media, for the journalism, you can say, okay, they are, they are suffering. They, 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 but it's, it, it doesn't make big news headline. If there's another explosion at the Fukushima, then you, there's a headline. There's another, maybe this prime minister said that they're going to do this and that, then this, this becomes the headline. Mm. But uh, just a regular citizen, the refugee people, the, they became refugee. They, they are without houses within their own country. And then th those people don't really make headlines. And I thought that's the one like, I, sh I have to film the documentary. Yeah. And so I would suggest we see um, a clip from the film Nuclear Nation Part 2 being, being premiered tomorrow at 4 o'clock. <laughs> Yeah.
Yeah, you mentioned Frederick Wiseman and also D.A. Pennebaker. These are um, the guys uh, inventing the direct cinema style, meaning not uh, interfering with um, yeah with the situation you have. But um, coming from yeah, I mean, coming from uh, also from the from the fiction film, doesn't it sometimes um, doesn't you sometimes feel like I mean repeating a moment or something like that you think okay this would be uh, this would be so good if she would have done this and that and then you uh, that you think about maybe asking her um, to repeat the situation um i don't stage the documentaries uh, i mean i know some filmmakers do but uh um as i said this is a, this is a kind of research process so like it's i'm in a different mode And uh, when I film, like, I try to absorb whatever I, I see. And that's kind of a uh, desire or, I always had. It's, uh, I, I went to the film school and I learned this, uh, filmmaking and I wrote scripts. But uh, always I felt I don't know about the world enough. So you are kind of living in a very small world and you try to write something interesting. But uh, I, I, I always ha felt this scare and fear. I don't know anything about it. So that's why like, I start doing a, a documentary. So whenever like, I shoot documentaries, I'm, I'm like observing, um, absorbing an observation mode. So like, I try to capture everything I can. Mm -hmm. So I, dra I don't judge, I don't plan, but I think about it on, on the editing board with a final cut. Mm -hmm. so, that's, so that's why like, I'm saying it's kind of not so interesting to me and also unethical to judge the, what you're trying to capture before what you're seeing, because like, you're kind of uh, throwing, you're casting your preconception, yeah. but uh, you don't know anything about it. So why you kind of think, you know, plan ahead? So you can switch into the documentary mode. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. a nice picture, a nice image. Okay, let's come to Marcelo Martinesi. Um, you, um, your work is concentrated on addressing topics um, concerning the Paraguayan civil war and um, former dictator, uh, long year dictatorship. Um, so these are socially and political very Im important um, uh, topics. Um, but nevertheless, you always. Um, um, really, uh, yeah, come near to the border between fiction and, 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 and documentary. Um, how do you see in general the responsibility towards the viewer to be sharply clear about what is real and what is not? Maybe just to begin with this general question. Yeah, that, also how, how important is it for you, or how do you, um, also how do you see the, the, the general, you know, your responsibility towards the viewer to show him exactly, okay, this what you see is, is real, this is, yeah, this is um, uh, not staged, and this is uh, fiction. Also, um, how important is it for you to, to make that clear? Um, I mainly, the, the work uh, I chose to show in a bit, and the, the, most of the work I do is fiction, but it's, it's clearly based on reality. And many times the problem that I see in my society with documentary is that um, you, uh, there are certain topics that you cannot approach because people have, uh, news are very big in all countries, and people have staged their own reality, and they have a speech that they repeat, and that's all they can do when they are approached by a journalist or by a documentary filmmaker. And sometimes when you have the time to live with this person, to research with this person and make them part of the, of the construction of your work, I find that a lot more interesting. Um, so I always, whatever reality I find, I approach it with victims of the dictatorship, with uh, people who wrote about our civil war because the people who lived there uh, during the civil war are no longer alive and with children living on the street, whatever reality, I think it's always important to try to get as close as possible to the subject, get them involved. And what happens to me many times when I do that is I feel that I could be betraying part of what they are hiding by making a documentary. It, this happened to me many times. I felt there are a lot of things that they are hiding and we have to respect that. So in many ways, sometimes a fiction work has helped me to really tell a lot about the reality without seeing the actual face of the person or without actually knowing who, who is the person that this happened to. Mm -hmm. So it's always, uh, uh, I think, that, that's why the boundaries between fiction and documentary are really <coughs> difficult sometimes. Uh, and many times my work is like 
sent to documentary uh, sections. And I say, why do they put it in documentary? And I write to the festival, and they said, isn't this a documentary? And I said, no, it's a fiction, but they see it as a documentary, and I, you have to be kind of always trying to discuss this um, approach that, that the world has. And I think it, that's why sometimes it's nice to just talk about cinema and leave uh, uh, the formats. I mean, they have a, uh, sometimes people really want to tag everything, and sometimes it's interesting just to be free and work around whatever you, subject that inspires you and give it the shape that it deserves according to the actual subject and according to the human experience. Because I think um, fiction, documentary, and even journalism always what touches us the, as the most as viewers, the thing that they have in common is the human experience, is how the, this affected, how, how the in nuclear nation it affected these people. What you were talking uh, uh, is just, and in journalism, I think I, I was glad to discuss today with probably some documentary filmmakers, what we can appropriate from journalism, because I think journalism has been appropriating for decades things of documentary film and of fiction film without the honesty to admit it. <laughs> so it's very interesting that we see journalism and we try to get something out of them as well, kind of a revenge, because I think uh, in many ways uh, we have to recover the importance of truth in this whole uh, current situation. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I mean, totally agree, but um, the question of truth is really in the center of it, and we come later to it. But I would first of all like to um, to present you um, also a clip from, from your film. It's um, Ultima Street. Um, that film run, uh, ran in the Berlinale uh, Generation 2011, and we have a small uh, three-minute clip from that, and afterwards we can... Or would you like to say... Before, uh, I, before? I would like to just brief, briefly mention oh. the, this is uh, Calle Ultima in Spanish, I was hired to make it. This is exactly the situation I was talking about. I was hired by UNICEF, European Union, and many people, they said, we want you to make a documentary about children and working on the streets. And of course, they said, these children are school dropout. They are between five and 13 years old. They, um, they work, some of them work as selling things on the streets. Some of them beg. Some of them work in child prostitution. So it was a really complicated thing, and they said, well, basically, they told me, we want you to make a documentary. We are very worried. These children need to go to school, and they need to live with their families, not in the streets. But when I tried to approach a documentary, and I met these children, I mean, I found this reality that they, for them, school was hell, because they were always seen as the lowest of the lowest in school, because they couldn't afford a proper uniform. And for many of them, family was hell. Of course, they, they had this abusive parents, and they were only growing to repeat that behavior. So I approached these people again, and I said, I cannot make a documentary, because I'll be betraying feelings that they will never come out in a, in a documentary unless I, I, do, I betray them. So, why, so we went through a, to a work, uh, we did a one year, kind of once a month, we met with these children. They wrote their own stories. We perform, they per play each other, and we created a fiction work based on this experience that how they deal with home and how they deal with school, and we'll see you next time. Okay, great, great. So, please. please. So um, this is a kind of a retelling of reality. Let's call it like that. Is it uh, would this fit or um, <laughs> retell of reality? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they. I didn't write the script. I, I mean, I, I organized the writing of the script with them, and basically the short is about this girl who spends uh, a lot of time looking for shoes to go to school, and when I listen to them talking to me, the way they are treated at school because they don't have shoes. I mean. Children can be very cruel. And of course, in school, there is also a, it's also a small class system. And they f feel they always be uh, looked at as children working on the street or as ex-sex workers, which is even worse. And children will tell them things about them, will play with that. And I mean, I work with 
children, um, girls that were about 13, year, 13 years old, and they had a child, some of them two years old child or two children. It was very com complex reality. And of course, for them, family was not the right place to be. But the country was not offering also any alternative. So in a way, it was a learning experience through the process to see that probably, and I had a very interesting debate with people from UNICEF and from Euro European, Union, European Union who financed this project because they started wanting these children to go to school and to live with their families, and they end up not finding the right uh, way to approach such a complex problem. And so, um, and the girl is the girl, um, I mean, this is, uh, she's more or less playing her own... Um... And she's playing someone, she has a child, she, ha she was here 13 or 14, mm -hmm. she has a child that also performs in the film, but she's playing someone else's role. They switch roles, and of course it was, at the beginning it was uh, difficult, but then they play with it a lot, and they have kind of a humor about playing each other, and we made about five short films at rehearsal, to make this final film, which was which invest more uh, camera work and stuff like that in, in Calle Ultima, but we made a lot of uh, li small approaches mm -hmm. and we watched a lot of films about children in order to give them some um, approach to playing their own reality and to show them what we could do with this. Mm -hmm. And it was a very, for me, it was an interesting experience to watch. They came to Berlinale with me to present mm -hmm. the film, so it was a very strong, the whole project was very strong, I think it had a strong impact in the... Who are those uh, parents, people, that those are the professional actors? And pa no. Parents? No, 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 they were all uh, people from the, let's say, from the neighborhoods, the, from the villages where we were shooting, where there were no professional actors. Uh, but they are not her parents? No, 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 no. they're not her parents. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, okay, so, so th this is a, a message uh, you, you chose there, which is, I would say, called reenactment in a way, right? I mean, that is uh, um, um, a strategy um, for, I would say, in yeah, more historical or um, scientific um, <clears throat> documentaries. Um, and this is interesting that you that you chose this way to um, because you, you thought, you, okay, there's something we can't really show it, so we have to find another way to make it. Um, for for viewers understandable, right? I mean, and this is an approach to come to uh, to Shaibu just for a moment, just to uh, to tell that is more or less the same strategy as journalists do, right? I mean, um, uh, telling the truth in a yeah in a um, artificial way, in a way. Yeah, we go, yeah, we also do this kind of retelling, but we do it in the future stories angle when you really don't want to go into deep into depicting reality. You could find a fiction, I mean, you could find, you could use the feature angle to write a story, I mean, to create something, but actually you're reporting reality. So we have that, you know, aspect to in journalism. So there's a lot really that, you know, there's a relationship, a very big relationship between journalism and documentary filmmaking. The only, the only aspect that I find, I mean, sometimes very, uh, uh, the difference actually is a, where you have to talk about objectivity. And you know in journalism you have line of editors who have to check what you're doing. But here you are self-editing. Mm -hmm. So it's the kind of, it's what you want to put out there that you put out. But I mean, if I write a report, I have to pass it through <laughs> several line of editors yeah. to check. And when they check and they find out that, no, what you're talking about is you are missing the point or you are over-fictionalizing the story, they will, they will, they will, it can be a sponge. Mm -hmm. But here you have a self-editor who just sits down and says, okay, this is how I want to tell the story. This is how, but you don't have that kind of liberty as a, as a journalist, especially if you are not in the editorial cadre. If you're just a news reporter, you don't have that kind of liberty to retell yeah. in this manner and all that. Yeah. So, I mean, we do all that too. But you can only do that as future writing, but you can't do this as news. You can't recreate news the way it is, especially when you have to have it on the front pages or on the news pages. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just want to say one thing about the, uh, the extra I, I chose is something you get mainly when you are in Paraguay, that all these social problems has, of course, have a, a cause which has to do with a one-party regime we had for more than 60 years. 
So what uh, we did when we were editing, the man is watching television and we chose a part of television news that talks about the lack of medicine in the public hospitals and all the problems and you hear the music of the, the, the kind of theme of that political party because they are getting the medicine only if you are from their party. So in a way that was also a way of making reality jump into a world that is completely fiction but if we, of course, if that was the departing uh, point of the project, we wouldn't be able to finance it. Mm. So it has to be like introducing small, making reality jump into fiction work, sometimes with small details like that. Mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah. Um, well, you, you talked about um, your decision um, between making a documentary about something or a fiction about something. I would like to, um, uh, to ask this question also to um, Atsushi Funahashi because um, you also did a fiction film um, which is more, um, let's say, which has more or less the Fukushima topic uh, in it. Uh, in it. Uh, it's called Cold Bloom from 2012. Um, could you maybe also s um, tell, me, tell us something about these two different approaches of uh, um, yeah, addressing this topic um, by, via documentary or via fiction film? Um, like, like uh, I made a Big River there's a documentary first, then I made a fiction film. Same thing happened. I made a documentary first, a uh, nuclear nation. Then I made a cold broom. Uh, I made a nuclear nation in 2012, and I came here to, to Berlin Alley. Then I made a cold broom right after 2013, actually. And uh, to me, the, um, you know, as I said, I, I've been a cinephile for a long time and I'm just a, a cinema buff and I watch, love watching movies. And uh, to me, it's, uh, there's no distinction between the documentary and the fiction. I, I just want to make cinema. And a cinema meaning like a, some uh, uh, moments with the reality. I mean, some real moments you want to capture. And then for the fiction, you use the professional actors or amateur actors, but uh, it's uh, staging with a scene. So that's the, my definition of a fiction. You know, it's more like a systematic difference. But it's a documentary, you don't really stage scenes, you just capture everything. So it's not really, it's both a cinema to me, but, and both you are trying to capture the real moment. And uh, you use actors and then try to, to me, like it's a fiction is a kind of staging, by staging actors, you try to shoot the documentary of actors. And so trying to capture some real moment. And then when you shoot the documentary, you, you just to capture the, what the real people do, but the, trying to find a very cinematic moment. So whenever like, I show my documentary, people say, oh, it's like a very cinematic, like a fiction film. Then whenever show, I show my fiction, they say, it's like some very documentary style. So <laughs> it's very interesting for me. And then one thing I choose, the one kind of principle I do, and. I found it later after March 11 was that when you are living in the middle of the disaster, maybe it's too soon to make a, a fiction out of it. For example, when the 9-11 happened, I was living in New York and then there's one movie called World Trade Center by Oliver Stone. And then besides it wasn't really interesting movie, I have to say, but you know, it, 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 you know, it was really, you know, uh, ill-talked. Like everybody bashed the film in the New York, uh, including the um, family members of the people who deceased uh, from the 9-11. It was made in 2006, so five years after 2001, 9-11. So it, it, it's been five years already, but, but people are still having this very sad feeling in, their, in themselves, and then, I don't know how many people you saw the World Trade Center, but uh, I mean, you know, it's not a great, great film. But uh, they are kind of, how do I say, uh, mysticizing. It's, they are making a fiction of this, the story of the firefighters. And then they, it was a really good story. But uh, for the families who lost their loved ones uh, in, as firefighters, it looks like uh, very cheesy to them. It made very cheap 
for them because the, the you know the Oliver Stone was kind of imagining how they suffered inside and they the, at the very moment right before they died in the building and then for the for the people who lost their loved ones they don't want to see that and also they don't want to be that fictionalized so like for them like they they were criticizing Oliver Stone that like it made it as like a cheese ball even they, the Oliver Stone tried to praise their effort, but it's not really the right way to praise it. Mm. And the same story to the Fukushima. In Japan, still, like, there are many refugees, as you see in the movie. So you, when you try to fictionalize like, uh, the big budget movie, like, uh, the, maybe t telling us a very sad story about the Fukushima, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a bunch of people get angry. Even you tell the right story, but it looks like you are trying to exploit, exploiting, making money out of this. Yeah. But there's one thing you said um, uh, where I have to yeah, no, come from my journalistic point to, to ask a question, because mm -hmm. you said, uh, uh, I don't care if it's fiction or, um, or documentary, I try to, to look for the cinematic way um, yeah. of making good cinema, let's say, let's make, make a good film, which is, of course, um, totally great and good, but um, I think the difference between, um, between um, let's say, shaping the character of an, uh, played by an actor and shaping um, a person, a real person, which has a, play, plays a role in, in some kind of history. Let's, let's for instance, take the, the mayor of um, Futaba, yeah. who, who had to step back. Um, I mean, um, when you, when you um, go to the editing room and you, um, and you cut around the character of, of an actor, so it's still a fiction person. But your, your responsibility to, um, to form the, um, the character, the, 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 the filmic character in your movie of this um, uh, mayor, for instance, I think this is a great um, responsibility. And that's what, what would be my question, if this uh, isn't a very important task for you to be objective there, to try to um, to make him not too you know sympathetical or not too I don't know bad or too too you know that you don't put too much opinion of your own opinion and feeling of this person into your film um, I try to be humble on the set try not to judge I try to as I said I, as I repeated like it's, I try to capture everything I see then I try to judge on the editing board so I don't really say this is a real story I, because this is a very subjective point of view when I edit. The order of the scene I edited, I had a 400-hour footage and I made out of it two-hour movie. Mm. Yeah. So it's, it's intentional editing. So it's when you edit like that way, then this is already fiction. Right. You know? Yeah. In a way. Yeah, in a way. So, uh, it's, it's, I, I wouldn't say this is an objective point of view. It's, it's just I'm always telling this is what I saw mm. from my point of view. And this is a subjective point of view. But I try to be fair with what I saw there. So, it's not, I'm not, I, I, I try not to lie. Like a, let's mm. say like a, there's a, like a bunch of people there and then getting uh, lots of compensation from TEPCO and then they're really well fed and then they, they got a certain money, then there's only one person in the uh, shelter, then he didn't get the money. Mm. But uh, by focusing on this one person, then you can, you can magnify, oh, this is a very sad story. Mm. You know, there's no food or there's no money, you know, but it's not the truth. Yeah. It's not true. So like, you have to see the truth and you have to research in that way. But, uh, you know, the very important point is that, like, uh, as we are discussing right now, is the, the, the Paraguay and the Nigeria, this uh, the big uh, difference between the journalism and the uh, cinema. I know journalism and the documentary, I would say. Mm -hmm. Or journalism and cinema is better, I think. They're, because, as I said, uh, the distinction between documentary and the fiction is not really there. Yeah. Uh, so, the difference to me, I mean, I'd like to ask you guys too, but to me, the, journal, the difference between journalism and uh, cinema is that journalism is the media you try to, uh, to, you, in which you try to uh, express something you can verbalize. Hmm. So it's something verbal. And in cinema, you try to express something non verbal, visual. Maybe, but uh, because the cinema is the media, you have a continuous 90 minute or 120 minute duration of time. 
yeah. which for the news you don't have, you have just two minutes or three minutes. Yeah. Or, or if it's a news paper, it's, you have a 200 words or something. So you have to compact it. And also you have to be very pointy about it, right? So you, you gotta be very factual when you do a journalism. Mm -hmm. But uh, like in my movie, Nuclear Nation 2, um, I try to express something they have lost. So it's not only the, something like, a, they, they lost not only houses or the cars or the furniture, but also they lost time and history and traditions mm -hmm. that you cannot compensate by money and then that you cannot really easily bubbleize. Yeah. So you can feel it within the duration of the cinema. So that's something cinema can do and uh, journalism cannot do. Okay. Thank you. Um, Marcelo, would you maybe, maybe, maybe add something to this? Because, um, um, for instance, I don't know exactly who it was, but uh, I think it's, um, it's an old saying, each cut is a lie, each cut is a lie. Um, yeah, meaning editing is fictionalizing, more or less. Um, could you um, add something from your position as a filmmaker? How do you um, see the, um, the editing process in, you know, in relation to telling the truth, being, being, being uh, correct uh, towards the reality? Um, yeah, I think many, there are many things you think in the editing room. E ethics, truth and also uh, making something approachable, making something, I mean, many times in the editing room, one of the questions we ask is, does people have enough information to understand what we're trying to, to portray? But this was, in a way, uh, hearing this, I, I, I think that's interesting, your, the difference you made between journalism and cinema. I mean, this is uh, verbalizing, and this is uh, showing in many ways, but um, I think we also have to be aware of the crisis of journalism and how manipulated uh, the news are. And even when I received this, I wanted to, s the first question that came to me is what is news? I mean, and I have this, can I, it's a very short definition of um, John, John Swinton, a New York journalist. More than a hundred years ago, he talked about what the business of journalists is. And he said the business of the journalist is to destroy the truth, to lie to sell his country and his, ray, and his race to his daily bread. We are the tools of rich men behind the scenes. We are the jumping jacks, they pull the strings and we dance. Our talents, our possibilities, and our lives are all the property of other men. We are intellectual prostitutes. And I think... <laughs> That gives a huge definition of what we are fighting against when we have to deal with documentary filmmaking and when we have to deal with truth. Because this is happening in the world and we have a very strong tool that is a camera, the sound, everything, to tell the stories that they are not telling. And many times when you uh, see the way the, the media is uh, owned around, in, in Paraguay is obvious. I mean, three people decides the information seven million people has. So that's just a, 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 a Paraguay is always ca chaotic in the examples of what the world is, you know. I, I think the distribution in the world might be a bit more, um, a bit different um, <clears throat> in numbers, but I believe that if we have, if we're facing this uh, play with the, with the truth, we have a huge responsibility. And I see that even some of the documentary funding sources receive money from foundations that have the same owners than the media in the world has. Mm. So in a way, we not only have to discuss, I think, in this kind of environment, how we um, tell the truth, but how, also how we help to finance the truth, which is also, I think, a, a huge challenge. Mm. That's true. Yeah. 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 I just want to add to that a bit and just talk about, I mean, the crisis that he also talked about. And it has a lot to do with the media, uh, the policy of the medium, you know. And now ownership, very few people are owning the media. So they detect what gets out in the media. And we in Africa suffer it a great deal because I've been here for four days. And each time I tune to the TV station, what I just hear is a sided report 
of what happens in Africa. Mm -hmm. Just recently, um, there was a protest not to, annul, not to postpone the elections in my country. Mm -hmm. And when I saw the news, I only saw the protest by those who said the election should go on. Mm -hmm. I didn't see the protest by those who said, no, we don't have to go with the elections. I mean, right. so what you don't get actually from the conventional news media, you, pro you get from the documentary because right. the documentary has to balance. You know, it's, he has an obligation to balance mm -hmm. the report because he is the one doing it. He doesn't have to pander to the whims and caprices of the owner of the medium. So you find out that the more, you know, the media ownership is shrinking, mm -hmm. the more we are not being very objective. The more we are just taking handouts from the owners and saying, look, this is the direction that I want this news to flow. They are becoming more partisan now. They are becoming more sectional now. They are becoming, uh, I don't know. I mean, there's no, like, like I'm, I'm just going to, I, I think I will adopt this, this definition as really what is happening, you know, to journalism, you know, across, I mean, across the world, not just in the West or yep. uh, in Africa. So you're saying like a documentaries have a journalistic role, definitely, in that kind of situation yeah, where that the media kind of, is very unbalanced. Yes, in that very, in that very situation, it provides more information, it provides a balanced information, um, but that is not to say that there are no stories that are not balanced in journalism, and all. No, that's not to say, but I'm saying that what you don't find in the paper or in the media, in the news media, you can find in documentaries because they try to have a balance. They can't speak to figure A and not talk to figure B. Yeah. Great task for documentaries, but, um, but thanks for this. Sorry, I was um, uh, really too, too late for, um, to ask. Uh, please, have you, uh, any questions? I think you get an, uh, one second, you get a micro. I think that's better. Because back there, yeah. yeah it's, it's not so much a question, but who was it who said that uh, truth was sometimes better served? Uh, Fiction could, sorry, um, it, it's, it's the idea that if you want to say something, maybe documentary isn't the best way to say it, it could be said through fiction. And in, in the work that you've done with these children, I mean, if they don't have to play themselves, then they, it opens things up much further. Who, who was it who put that out there? Who that, was? That, yeah, like. I, I mean, what was the question about I mean, the, who? The, the, I don't know, I've just, over the years, I've came across some, some information. Somebody might have said at one point that the, the truth could be better served with fiction. And uh, it seems to me that's what you're... Yeah, I think yeah, he yeah, said yeah. that. Yeah, I, um, the thing is, I come from a society where fantasy has a huge role. I mean, people, you imagine in Latin America, we have all this magic realism, and we have all this tradition of storytelling and mixing fiction with news and reality with fantasy and everything. So I think doing this kind of work is only natural <laughs> to where I come from. I mean, we always see Europe as a place where people tend to be really close or attached to facts, facts. And we are so different in that way that I think uh, that really happens mainly uh, for, in a way for where I come from and how people behave and I think in many ways, I've seen documentaries that are far from the truth, that are completely um, not telling you what's really happening. And I have seen fiction that is a lot closer. So like we were saying here, cinema has all these possibilities and mixing both. And, but what I'm very clear about is that do never expect journalism to tell you the truth. So in that sense, I think our are, it's very important what we can... I'm not talking about the kind of journalist you do, sorry. No, I want to be clear. No, I, know, I, don't, want to I don't want to talk... Uh, I'm talking about what we were saying here and what we agree, that it's very difficult to find a way of uh, find media that will not have a huge interest back in it. Uh, one thing I want to add to that point is that sometimes uh, fiction can add the truth really very strong truth from the physical, you know, programma pr programmatic point of view of filmmaking. You know, in documentary filmmaking, you, you, you are not really always be there. 
So you have, you, let's say you want to make a story like this, but you know, on the editing board, but you have this scene, this scene, then you don't have these scenes, and you have this scene. So you, you can only show by showing one, two, five, then let the uh, people imagine what happened in a three and a four. Then sometimes storytelling wise, it's not really fulfilling story. Mm -hmm. So you don't really, you know, that happens all the time and it's kind of a frustration I always have when I make a documentaries. But uh, I take that, okay, okay go ahead. No, no, okay. Yeah. There, there was let, me, but, uh, so let me finish what I want to say very quick. But, uh, um, so, uh, when you wanna when you wanna get into the psychology of the people, fiction is a really good tool because you can script out everything, and that's why that's how why like, I made a, a cold broom, the film. This this is a, a, a story about the woman who lost her loved ones, the husband, and then she falls in love with one guy, uh, who killed her husband accidentally, but she didn't know. So it's kind of forbidden love story, but I kind of uh, synchronized this storyline with what happened to the Japanese people after the March 11, this uh, earthquake and the tsunami. There are many people feeling this loss, huge loss, by losing their loved ones, and then they couldn't, they they couldn't have a closure because they were when they get swamped by tsunami, they sometimes they they couldn't find found uh, they couldn't find the dead bodies, so they couldn't meet their closure. And it, it, they feel like uh, their loved ones come back home and uh, open the door any time. Because, you know, uh, it's it really, you, they didn't physically see their bodies. And uh, so I really wanted to uh, make this story that about this, uh, trying to express this loss many people in Japan had. So that's, that's how, I, when, I, when I tried to get deep into the, this one person psychology, then maybe I thought it's a, you know, fiction is a much better media than documentary. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one, two, three. So up there. Yeah. Um, hi, it's the kind of an ethical um, question, ethical question that I have. Um, more you work in documentary, and um, but you fictionize it a lot. Um, Marcelo, you were saying before you ask your protagonist to switch characters, you know, do the traveling again because it looks nicer, so on. How you do with the money? Um, do you pay them? Um, where are their rights? Um, because at the end they're also acting in your film, and even if you have really good intentions, um, you're also using their lives in a way for your purpose. So where are the boundaries there? Yeah, um, it's always a question uh, when we approach, in most of my projects, I have this issue. How do you, we do pay them. I mean, we, we are, they are part of a project. In this case, most of the kids playing in the film, they are part of a project that uh, <laughs> saves them from prostitution houses. And we believe that we can use a process. Also, it was a process that um, a lot of uh, psychology, uh, psychologists participated in order to help them to understand what we were doing and to go along with the decisions they were telling. Of course, we, are not, they, uh, we had to ask permission for the parents to shoot the film because they are minors, and, uh, but the money went to them. It was a very complex, um, structure that was managed mainly by the NGO that has this house where some of them were living at the moment of making the documentary. And of course, I think it is um, a very uh, complicated uh, approach to reality when you're touching anyone's life. But I think in, in that case, there are two main things. One is talking to the person in order to be absolutely, I mean, before shooting the film, we read the script together, we took things out, we put things in, and we discussed how they felt comfortable. And in the, in the fiction film, you don't know who is who, and I think in a documentary, even covering their face, that will be a lot more obvious. So in a way, I think it's making, the first thing is making them part of the decisions 
of the project and the impact it can have in their lives. And also um, the second decision, which is always crucial for me when approaching a project like this, is, is the film worth doing all this effort? Because I think film, I believe in the power of film to change the way people think. I, we made this film in order to make authorities rethink about the amount of dropouts in Paraguay because they, they have to go with a uniform that they cannot afford. We made people think that if they want to send this, these kids to their home, they're sending them to a place where they will go out again and go into drugs and we have to find other solutions. So I think those are the main two ethical, um, I don't know, ethical uh, approaches that I can tell you that we do to, when, when, we, when we talk about real life and real people. And I do think it's very interesting, your question, and I think it's very important to always be aware of uh, the impact your work, has in, in the, your work has in the real world. And also, um, like I said, make a whole, um, give it attention give it the attention it deserves. Mm. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you, I think um, it was you, yeah. Next one. Um, yeah, I'd like to make a somewhat, uh, somehow polemic <coughs> statement and like you to react to that. So um, for me, the, the, the concept of, of truth is highly overrated and I'm of the opinion that truth is owned by very few people. So let's say, you no, know, it's always the same big corporations and politicians and whoever is in power who owns the truth. So for me, for whoever works with a visual media, it's the obligation to counterbalance that and totally forget about truth. And I would like to under explain that with an example. Um, in Brazil, in the favelas of Rio, for example, the news, we have the journalists going there whenever there's blood and war and violence. Um, most of the times, uh, most days of the year, there is no blood and crime and violence, and most people actually work for the rich people cleaning the houses and taking care of the children. And then there's also fictional movies like City of God, which shows the favela only when there is drugs, crime and violence. And Brazil is also a country where all movies from Brazil, in the beginning you always see the big logo of Petrobras, one of the biggest oil companies of the world. So I think all this, I don't need that. It's all um, showing, um, serving this 1% which is in power. So I think no matter if it's fiction or documentary or journalism, we have to aggressively and, and uh, precisely counterbalance their truth. Because I, mean, I think there's as many truth as there's people on this planet. Yeah, that's a bit in the direction. Um um, you, you said it. That's right. There's a lot of, a lot of truth, uh, a lot of different kinds of truth around. Um, does somebody want to uh, directly go on to this? Because, I, I agree. Yeah. I don't know how to. I mean, I think in the case of, specific case of Petrobras, I see they finance work that sometimes is, is very interesting. And I believe in order to destroy that 1%, we need to use them. So if we need to use money of Petrobras to do something, I would use it because I believe if we try to be pure and say, no, I will only be financed by the priest or who, whatever you believe on, I think we'll never get where we want to get. I think the, 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 the um, tools to kill the, the, the huge difference in the world <coughs> is in using the capitalism itself, the, 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 the how to, how to kill the, the, the system is inside the system. Um, I, I know many people that we always have this discussion in Paraguay, if you can be outside the system to attack it, and it's very difficult. It's a lot better to be inside and attack it from there. Uh, one thing that I can add is that um, the, um, as you said, I agree with you because there are many truths, uh, you know, as much as the, the storytellers. Because there are many filmmakers, and then uh, the different if different person tell one same story, then it's gonna look uh, be looked differently. I I totally agree with you, but um, you know, uh, and also there's another aspect of filmmaking I want to add here is the uh, it's between a difference between the propaganda 
and a documentary. When you try to tell a, the one message, then you can make a propaganda movie. But uh, it's, uh, then it becomes less interesting as a movie because all you try to say is uh, just uh, constru construct uh, one single message at the bo bottom. So it's like uh, writing a thesis. So I say, you know, when you, so it's not interesting. So you kind of, we have to try to find a fine balance. You want to make it uh, very interesting as a cinema, as rich as, you know, reality, if possible. Then also, if you want to still, you can still make a message out of it too. So it's more like a recreation of the world and then it's as rich and uh, the very strong as uh, the what you saw. And uh, this, is, uh, this is not really a single way to do it. But uh, wh whenever like, I try to make a clear message out of the documentary, then I realize sometimes it gets less interesting. Yeah, right. So um, I promised one last question. <laughs> Hello. Um, so I agree that truth is a very complex uh, concept and uh, personally for me the difference between journalism or news journalism especially and documentary is the difference between different ideas of truth. One is the factual idea of truth, you show facts and for me documentary is much more about human truth and uh, human stories. So I, for me the, the role of documentary is very much to create understanding for human stories. And uh, coming from that angle, I would like to ask Marcelo why he chose to fictionalize these stories, these stories so much. Because I could imagine a documentary following different characters around if you have you know, a year's time to get to know them. But you chose to, to work with them on a fictional script, which I think is a very interesting approach. But I would like to ask you why, why you choose to do it, to fictionalize it to that extent. Um, mainly, uh, mainly to protect them. I think the truth that came in a fiction work will not come in a documentary because we will be exposing them. They will never tell me how the parents treat them. They will never tell me. I mean, there are scenes here of girls living in a, in a prostitution house. They will never admit to a camera. We'll have to find someone else that is not them giving their voice to what was happening to them. Say, no, these girls are that. And I said, if them themselves are able to work around what's happening and make it become a fiction, it, for me, it was more interesting to work with them in a fiction project than trying to create a documentary about uh, something, or at least I didn't see myself probably capable of getting out of this very complex reality uh, in something in the documentary format. Maybe it's also that. Maybe it's also that I come more from fiction. But I think if I spend a lot of time with them, with a camera, there are things that I will be not, I will be uh, repress myself from asking. I won't allow myself to observe. There are many times uh, I'm currently doing something about uh, Kuruwatu, which is a huge tragedy in Paraguay where a lot of people died. And we are doing it only with sound, not with the images of people, because we go at 4.30 in the morning when they get up, we sit down, we have mate, we drink mate, and we talk. And that's when the truth comes. And I feel I will betray them if I tell you who this person is. And and I will also be, I don't know, using some, a, a method that will not allow me as a filmmaker to tell the story that I feel is closer to truth. So I think it's also, I do admire documentary makers who have this ability. Maybe I don't have it and I feel more comfortable as well in this, uh, in this way of working. Okay, um, time is up, I fear. So um, thanks a lot for your for your great um, contribution to this to this topic. And I would uh, um, like to end. With, uh, I even prepared a smart ass ending with a with a, with a quote by Jean Luc Godard. Of course, all great fiction films tend towards documentary, just as all great documentaries tend towards fiction. And in this sense, I would like to thank you for coming, Marcelo Martinesi, Atsushi Funahashi, Jaipu Husseini. Thanks a lot. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Time.